das ein Wort. Okay, let's do it here. Yeah. Okay, so good morning. Uh, my name is Laura Ferranti and I'm working at the uh, ECMWS. And um, I'm, um, I'm working more on the sort of the operational side of the activity of ECMWS, so looking uh, in, in the forecast department. So looking more really at the evaluation of the forecast. So uh, I would like to give you uh, today a sort of point of view of uh, how we evaluate extend range forecasts um, try and trying to assess uh, uh, their, their skill um, in, with particular attention to the ability of this forecast to uh, uh, simulate, represent uh, the tropical and intertropical, in, in, uh, tropical and extratropical interaction. So I would like to introduce really the concept of, of uh, uh, conditional skill in the uh, extended range forecast, long range forecast, uh, we have, uh, we know there are some sources of predictability uh, from which we, we justify to do extended range forecast. And so when these sources are active, uh, the skill is higher. When these sources are inactive, the skill are, is less uh, enhanced. And uh, here is really how uh, my, my sort of responsibility uh, in, in our team is to work and try to diagnose and improve the forecast on uh, representing and exploit at a uh, at more effective way such a source of predictability. So um, the MWF issues forecast at uh, medium, uh, sub-seasonal and seasonal ranges. And uh, if you look at uh, um, the sub-seasonal ranges, uh, we are looking, we're trying to do prediction uh, of uh, uh, events that, uh, that no, don't represent the day-to-day -day variability, but represent uh, va uh, variability on the order of, uh, let's uh, say, week, week or five days. So uh, events that tend to persist uh, uh, for about five days. And this, such, a, such events are cold and warm spell or blocking events. Um, and, uh, the source of predictability that is associated to uh, uh, this kind of forecast uh, are based on uh, um, the effect of the MGO, uh, which we have heard uh, many times uh, during this uh, week, and also uh, other sources uh, of predictability on this time scale come from uh, the, uh, con the land surface condition, the cryosphere, and the stratospheric sudden warming. Um, for uh, the seasonal forecast, uh, um, we, have, uh, we are trying to uh, predict ENSO, the variability on ENSO, and, and therefore we are trying to predict uh, anomalies that uh, tend to uh, persist for longer time, typically months or seasons. And, uh, and again, this kind of uh, uh, long-range forecast uh, uh, relies on a source of predictability such as ENSO, global climate change, decay of variability, length surface cryosphere, and interaction with the stratosphere. So because here we are talking about tropical, tropical interaction, we focus on the MGO for the subseasonal time and the ENSO on the seasonal time. But we should not forget that we are also looking at other sources. Okay? So the idea here is really the conditional skill. So we know, for example, if you look at the seasonal forecast, that uh, uh, if we stratify the skill of taking uh, ENSO here and, or taking the whole sample, we, we have a different uh, value of skill. So this is a, a, a paper from Lipsi and Timo Kajeva in 2008, where they actually did exactly that. So they look at the skill uh, for a three months uh, average over the uh, US. Uh, these are temperature forecasts. And uh, you have the skill in terms of uh, um, as a function of the lead month, lead time, and then you see that they have actually put all the all the samples together, and you have the skill that is uh, uh, defined by the sort of the diamond, so somewhere in in the middle of these three curves. And then if you actually set it, just take the answer episode, you have a much higher skill. So this is the concept of the sort of conditional skill, looking at the opportunity given by the answer. 
Um, so you can do the same for the subseasonal uh, time scale. And this is actually it's a bit of an historical thing, because at the beginning, the subseasonal was something that was not actually thought in the, uh, that was possible, because uh, um, uh, the MGO, uh, which is the most important uh, uh, mode of uh, uh, interseasonal variability in the tropics, was actually very well defined and detected only in the 1970s. Uh, and so um, uh, at the beginning, when, we were, when there was a numerical weather prediction, we were really focusing to improve the forecast on the estropopic. And there was this idea that the tropical didn't really matter very much. Uh, but then uh, um, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, uh, knowledge of the existence of the MGO and the importance of the interaction between tropics, and ectotropics, uh, it became clear that the, the idea that although the, the mid-latitude variability uh, is, is really driven by the internal dynamics, uh, there is a, a, an important part of the tropics' role that play modulate such a, can modulate such a variability. So we can have, uh, a, 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 uh, we can have predictability in a time scale, of, in a subsystem time scale. So this is, again, is another old paper from Mary Hendon et al. in 2000, where they were trying to, to, uh, to look at, at the same thing. So let's say, what about if we get, uh, uh, look at the skill stratified by looking at event when there, are, there is an MGO on an event when there is not an MGO. And actually, this is a skill measure uh, in terms of anomaly correlation over the estrotropics, over the northern hemisphere. And this is funny that they got exactly the opposite of what we are saying here. So they got a higher skill for uh, the event where there was no MGO, and they got a uh, uh, lower, uh, lower skill for the event where there was an MGO. And, uh, and you wonder why. And the reasons why is actually that the forecasts at that time, they were not very good. So it was very difficult, actually, to represent MGO events. Uh, and so we had to put quite a bit of uh, uh, effort to represent the, the tropical variability right to get uh, the predictability associated with the MGO. So at that time, this was uh, the, the sort of the statement that was coming out from uh, this paper. So less skill for forecast with MGO events is actually due to the inability of the model at that time to sustain the MGO, and therefore to the way they, there was no uh, rocky way source that was uh, uh, creating uh, this uh, uh, teleconnection into the astrotropic. So uh, there was uh, several papers that at that point uh, um, um, state the importance of reducing error in the tropics, the importance of representing the MGO correctly, and, uh, and uh, in this way, to be able to exploit the, really the, 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 the response in the astrotropics. So the importance of reproducing the teleconnection for, for the forecast field on the subseasonal time scale. So after that, a lot of uh, um, uh, um, work has been done to try to reproduce, to try to make models more um, accurate in reproducing the MGO. And uh, so so in introducing the variability in the tropics in the right, in more accurate as possible. And, uh, and uh, at the MWF, we measure uh, um, very careful the kind of progress we do in representing uh, the, the, the MGO um, uh, events. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, a paper from uh, uh, Frederick Vitar in 2012, which by using a, a, a reforecast, uh, uh, it has actually created a, a sort of uh, a, the evolution of the skill of the NGO. Uh, so how a system uh, prog progress every every year we do uh, we apply we implement roughly two cycles per year in which we include uh, include uh, uh, modification and progress in representing the physical uh, parameterizations. Uh, we uh, announce uh, uh, resolution horizontal. Uh, and spatial and so on. And so this is basically the evolution of the skill of the NGO um, as a function of the year from 2002 where we started to do the uh, subseasonal uh, forecast. So this uh, uh, red line is basically the anomaly, is the date, is the, 
the, the skill is as a function is the, the time in this in the year, so, so the evolution in time, and the, on the y-axis is the the number of days, the, the days. So it's basically how the, uh, when is when the skill uh, um, uh, which day the skill uh, fall uh, goes under um, 0 0.5. This is the anomaly correlation, uh, and so you can see that we have actually gained quite a bit of number of days from uh, 2003 to 2013. Uh, associated with that, um, there is a, a sort of uh, um, correspondence in uh, looking at a similar evolution of the skill, but this time looking at the, the parameter in the northern hemisphere, so this is the summit ascension. So you have uh, um, an evolution. So that's where we believe is the foundation of working on the subsequent time scale. So um, I guess that you have already seen this picture, so I'm going quite quickly on that. So one of the, uh, the um, work we are, one of the, the points we are trying to, uh, to do then is not only assessing how much uh, uh, the skill, uh, how the skill uh, is modulated by the, the different uh, um, source of uh, predictability. So we are looking at conditional skill, but also uh, uh, trying to understand uh, how the teleconnection in the, in the model uh, are reproduced. This is, goes back also to all the work that Franco does. Um, and this is a, an example from, uh, again, a paper uh, from Vitas in which using the S2S dataset, uh, look at the and the teleconnections associated with the MGO. So these are composites of geopotential height, uh, uh, 11, 15 days um, lagged with respect to uh, event, MGO events that they have, are in phase six. So there is an action phase over the Indian Ocean. And you can see the response uh, are quite, so there is a quite different uh, flavor of the response, which uh, should, as a reference should be the one on top, which is, uh, is the response from uh, the era interim, so it's our sort of a reference verification um, uh, response. And it's, again, uh, the NAO structure that we are looking at after. What are the numbers there? These numbers, I believe, is a correlation, for, is a cor is a correlation to an NAO standard pattern. Just to give a sort of report, if I me measure what flows are to you know. So, um, as I said, we, we don't look only at, uh, so when we do this uh, skill, uh, conditional skill, we don't look only at the tropical and tropical interaction. We try to really look at all the impact, uh, all the source of, of predictability. And in this case, this is a, 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 a work from the in 2015, in which it is actually stratified uh, the skill uh, as a function of uh, um, whether you have or not uh, the stratospheric sudden warming. So in this case here we are looking at the condition of skill associated with uh, uh, the stratosphere, the effect of the stratosphere. And you can see that, uh, you know, for the event, this is as a function different uh, week, week one, two, and three. And uh, this is still for two meter temperature over two different regions, Russia and Canada. And uh, you see that uh, the red uh, bars represent the skill for um, uh, events with, with the stratospheric as a warming and the blue is without. So you see that there is an effect. So this is one of the uh, work that we typically we, we are doing. But uh, today I would like to talk a bit more of, uh, of uh, trying to ask with that at the moment we have focused our, our um, effort in trying to ask uh, questions of this sort. Can we predict weeks ahead the changes in larger scale flow? Uh, and in particular, we are interested here at uh, uh, predicting uh, in advance uh, uh, cold spell over Europe. The idea is that uh, cold and, and also warm spell in summer, they actually uh, they have a, a, a strong uh, impact on society. This is an example for February 2012, where the water of Danube were completely frozen. And so the idea is really, can we use can we make a good use of the subsequent forecast for, uh, for the society? Uh, so uh, we have been looking at this uh, for quite some time. And for example, we have been looking at the, the ability of the subsequent forecast uh, in predicting the summer 2003. Uh, and, um, 
And uh, I've been looking more generally at the, at the ability of the forecast in uh, uh, predicting heat waves. And uh, we had this uh, impression that uh, really the important thing is to get uh, um, uh, the, the transition to an anticyclonic flow regime right. So because both heat and cold waves they're really associated to uh, a, a, an anticyclonic uh, circulation uh, that uh, uh, persists for some time. And so we are really focused really on uh, the ability of predicting uh, um, this uh, special uh, flow circulation that uh, facilitates uh, this uh, um, high impact uh, weather. So for this we are looking at, uh, uh, we are trying to look at weather regimes to start it. And uh, these are the weather regimes. I think we have been looking at weather regimes quite a bit, so I'm not going to describe them. We have these four uh, weather regimes which have been found by many people. Uh, Franco has given a very thorough um, uh, uh, overview and about this with the concept and the, and the theory on it. So I'm not going to make too much uh, 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 comment about it. But I would just to say, the reasons why we are looking at it. So we are looking at these four regimes because they are associated with high impact events. In particular, the blocking, um, the blocking over Greenland, which is also called the negative, the negative phase of the area, and the Scandinavian blocking. There are two uh, kinds of, uh, of regimes which are certainly associated with the uh, persistent anomalies of temperature. Uh, so, which can be defined as a high, end, uh, high temperature event. Uh, we are looking at them because they are they have a typically a, a quite long life cycle. They tend to persist longer than a week. So, they are really a typical object that uh, can be uh, forecast in the seasonal time scale. And also because they are associated through uh, erosive waves. Pattern, they are associated with forcing in the in the in the tropics. So this is referred more to Eileen and the food. So particularly for the annual positive and negative. So we have all the ingredients, this, this pattern, we have all the ingredients to, to, to be the right the target for the subseasonal forecast. So here I show you a sort of a, a, um, um, the skill of these four regimes. Uh, Starting uh, in terms, expressed in terms of anomaly correlation, and from uh, the function of day, from day three to day thirty, uh, the, the the skill has been filtered with a uh, running mean. And uh, I've actually picked up. Uh, this is a based, uh, it's a quite robust method of the skill because it's based on reforecast from SQS, and I've picked up a number of models available on SQS. And you can see that uh, you know there is a sort of uh, some potential there. So and then we have uh, quite uh, um, decent skill that goes well beyond the uh, 10 days for uh, this uh, for, for regime. There is a quite a bit of range of variability among the models, but the, the black one is the European system. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, it's encouraging uh, this, this kind of oversight. So, yeah, yeah. This is anomaly. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I, I show this, but I could show you also. We have we have done a lot of uh, also um, skill, probabilistic skills of of the forecast. It gives you very similar results. Yeah. Um, the question here is that, uh, going back to the fact that, okay, the fact that you, you, we have a decent skill on predicting uh, these regimes is important, but uh, we are really interested on, uh, on understanding whether we, we can say something on the transition from one regime to another, on the onset of, of this heat or cold spell. And uh, this is a much more difficult uh, kind of uh, uh, que um, the questions. And to try to address this, we have uh, sort of uh, created a very, very simple framework. Uh, so we are now going into two-dimensional uh, world. 
defined by two, uh, the first two leading EOF in geopotential height. So if you calculate the first two uh, EOF in the geopotential height, uh, you, you can find that the first one typically is the NNAO pattern, and the second one is the kind of Scandinavian blocking, if you like. Now, this is very simple, very symmetric. Uh, this, these two EOF explain together just 30% of the winter variability. So it's a very, very simplified and very limit, uh, limited kind of uh, uh, framework. But uh, we wanted really to understand uh, the transitions. And you know, if you are in two-dimensional space, this is possible. Um, so here is an example of, uh, um, of, of our space. So here we have the EOF1, and here we have the EOF2. And basically, if, if you are familiar with the MGO uh, index from Hendon and Wheeler, this is exactly the an an analogy of that index in the astrotropics. Um, so um, to show you if it works, uh, we have actually, have actually projected the daily fields of uh, two winters, two extreme winters in, in, in the North Atlantic sector. The winter 13-14, uh, which was a winter that was very stormy uh, and with mild temperature. And it was actually projected most of the time into uh, an annual positive. So he, we, we experienced uh, that winter very strong westerly going across Atlantic. And you can see this is a, you can actually follow the evolutions of the anomaly uh, uh, of, this, of this winter, the daily evolution from December, January, February is, is uh, uh, color coded. Um, looking at this diagram. And on the other side, you see the winter 2009, 2010, where instead it was a rather contrasting winter because it was a winter uh, in which most of the time uh, we had a kind of uh, grill and blocking. Uh, so uh, um, uh, just an opposite condition. So very, very cold uh, uh, condition of, of Northern Europe. And you can see there that there was quite going between blocking and, 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 and EO negative. So it seems like that at least for these two particularly contrasting winter, the, the, descrip the description in this very simple framework um, is effective. These are the, the two-meter ten, uh, two temperature anomaly for, uh, the, for, uh, for all the winter seasonal anomaly for 2013 and 14 and 2009 and 10 to show you the relation with the temperature. So um, we started to use this device for the forecaster. So now the forecaster are actually taking this kind of information here. And they make quite a big use. They are very fond, they've grown very fond of these things. And then, so now here what we are looking at, uh, example of uh, um, operation of forecast. Um, uh, this is a medium range forecast. Uh, this, so these are two different forecasts. This is initiated the 3rd of May. The, the other one is initiated the 15th, 25th of April. And, um, and you can see if you start with this one, this is the, uh, uh, the analysis that comes before the forecast. This is the initial condition of the forecast. Uh, so it's time zero. And this is uh, after one day, after two days, and so on. And so you can see that the cloud of the members, we are looking at 51 members here. Uh, become bigger and bigger as, uh, when you go further in the forecast. And here you see the transitions going. And this is the, another forecast from the other case. So um, looking at this is very easy visually uh, where we are going. And uh, forecaster seems to have a, 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 a quite passionate about it. It's, uh, it's, um, it's available for member states at the moment as a testing product, but next year we are trying to we will make it available. Sorry? Mem member states, yeah, is the MWF as a member state? No, no, North America, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, this actually, you can actually do, uh, we can also do it, uh, this is even more uh, sort of um, uh, on a research site. We can also apply this for, for uh, um, forecast that reach up to uh, 46 days. In this case, <coughs> this is an example of a forecast in, in, in the case on 27 of April, uh, which starts here, somewhere here. Okay? And, uh, and then now we are looking, because this is an extended range forecast, we are looking every five days. So this is uh, day zero. 
and the blue is day five, and the light blue is day ten. And you can see how the clouds open up. Now I have, I have to apologize. The graphic is not uh, ideal here. It should have been smoothed out, to making different colors and so on. But you can appreciate that uh, even at this range, by day uh, 15 to, to 20, you can actually see that the forecast is is doing a very uh, big evolution into into this phase space. Uh, actually, this the, is the verifying analysis, so I plotted a posteriori just for, for this sake. And in fact, this forecast actually gave uh, an anomaly of cold, because here we are going into an NO negative uh, <coughs> temperature here. So there is a strong relation with the forecasting uh, temperature, which was verified. So, of course, this is a successful story, it's a one particular forecast. It doesn't mean that we get it right all the time. But we went to see why this forecast was good. And the reason why this forecast was good is because we had an MGO. And this is, is quite uh, uh, impressive. Uh, so we had an MGO uh, traveling around. Uh, um, and uh, we believe, so these are two, two um, MGO uh, forecasts uh, for a similar period. Um, uh, that give you really the hint of how these two are connected. And we always, when we when we try to uh, train a forecaster to use uh, our forecast in the subsistence time scale, we always say, uh, even if you make your outlook of Europe, uh, look at the MGO. It's very important because if you look at the MGO, you can add confidence to your forecast. Uh, so. Going back now, this was one case. Now we want to look at uh, the, 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 the evaluate the, the skill uh, um, more in a general way. So we look again at the reforecast now, and we look at the, at the anomaly correlation for UF1 and UF2 separately. And we can see that these are all the same different model for S2S, uh, taken from S2S, and you have. Uh, um, uh, the UF1 is the, uh, the pattern that uh, um, uh, represents the NAO variability, the symmetric part of the NAO variability, and uh, the UF2 is the pattern representing the blocking uh, over Scandinavia. So you can see that the blocking, uh, the predictability of the blocking, the skill is, is a bit of a shorter time, a drop up to about 14 days. The NAO is a bit longer. Yeah? Um, but then again, stealing the ideas from uh, the MGO guys uh, that uh, they have come out with a bivariate uh, uh, correlation, you can also do the bivariate correlation uh, for the UF1 and UF2. And this gives us really the skill of really how good we are in performing the evolution in this two dimensional phase space. And again, so it gives us uh, some uh, uh, hope that we, get, we can do, we can give some prediction of cold spell or warm spell. Um, uh, uh, beyond uh, the, the, the medium range. So um, we can also go back and now to the nice talk that uh, Angel has given uh, some days ago about uh, how uh, we can look at frequency transition. And this is, is exactly one of your diagrams. I thought, oh, he has stolen my work. <laughs> so this is one of the diagrams that you are, you are doing as well. We have applied the same diagram, but uh, in the two-dimensional phase space. So here what you are looking at is, is trying to understand how the evolution in this very simple framework works. It, how is the, 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 the typical, the preferred transitions. Um, so um, what we have been looking at, been looking at is, is the, the frequency of the transition go, uh, going into blocking. So for example, if you fix it into this, uh, uh, into this uh, um, part of the diagram. So here I have counted the, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, about, what is it, about 36 years, the, uh, the daily data of error, error interim in looking into transition into blocking. And so this is the, the column with a uh, sort of a solid line that represent the, ana the analysis, the verification, and tell you what is the percentage of frequency in which if you end up in a blocking, you are eight days, between eight and six days, you were already in the blocking. So give you the, free, the frequency of transition for persistence. So this is the persistence uh, contribution. And this is, is the contribution coming from NAO positive, for NAO negative, and for, for uh, the sort of no blocking or Atlantic reach. 
So you can see that when the colors uh, more or less correspond, and this, this is done also for different focus ranges, okay? So if this diagram would have shown, um, because we have done a different focus range, you can appreciate whether in the focus there is a bias. So if the focus is actually in a, uh, has a problem to reproduce this transition, uh, you, would have, you would have a very sort of inconsistent colors here in this bias. But we don't find much of it. Actually, we find that it's a quite, I'm looking at the different ranges from 11, 16, to 21, up to 30 days. And you can see that the forecast actually is quite able to reproduce uh, um, uh, quite accurately the, 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 the transitions uh, um, uh, divided into the different, uh, the different uh, colors. Uh, I think what is extremely uh, interesting is this part of the diagram where you're looking at transition into DNO. So this is uh, going uh, in this diagram, going on this direction. I put that very thick arrow because this is a very strong statistic. So it tells you that basically most of the, most of the um, days uh, that go, mo most of the situation in which you go into a neonegative, uh, they, um, is, is they are coming from blocking. So it's really a typical, a typical, uh, so the typical uh, evolution into a Greenland block is a block, is a Scandinavian block. Um, and, uh, and then you, are, you, you can study as much as you like. But I think this is really, a, 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 again, it's an important fact, the fact that you have to check whether we have a strong biases in the model. Um, so then you can go back and you apply again this idea of the, the uh, conditional uh, skill uh, into the NAO, into the MGO, because we have seen that there are cases with the MGO, and we know also that the DNO is connected, the frequency of the NAO is connected with the MGO activity. And this is basically is the bivariate correlation uh, uh, for between UF1 and UF2 uh, for cases with MGO and without MGO. This is only our own forecast, because otherwise there would be too many curves to, to understand. And you can see there is, a, there is a, definitely a, an improvement uh, in, when you, it's better. To, we have a higher skill in making, following this evolution in, the, in these two uh, dimensional phase space for cases where we have uh, an MGO that is active. Uh, then you can also, uh, I'm also finished, eh? one more finished. You can also split and, and going to look at the sim symmetry between an AO positive and an AO negative. And this is what uh, we have been doing here. Now, now we are looking at the skill in terms of a probabilistic measure. This is a, uh, these are the Briar's skill scores, which measure uh, the mean uh, square error in probability space. And it's a skill score, so which means that uh, if you go up to one, you have a perfect model. If you go to zero, uh, the, climatolo the climatological forecast is better than your forecast. So you, you want to be above zero. Um, and again, these are the skill with and without MGO. The, the, the skill with MGO is the red line, without is, uh, is the black line. And then uh, the, 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 curve, the, the sort of almost parallel curve over there, uh, parallel to the uh, x-axis, is actually the resolution. The, the, the reliability, sorry, the, the reliability skill scores. Uh, which it, gave, it, it, gives, uh, it gives you uh, um, a measure of uh, how the probability of the forecast uh, um, match with the, the frequency of occurrence of the event. And so you can see that the, the, the difference between these two curves are, is not very large, and in fact is, is not even significant. So what the statement we can say here is that uh, for the NEO positive, prediction, the skill sensitivity to MGO is small and not significant. But when you look actually, uh, you do the same things for the negative NEO, you actually find a quite significant scale. Um, and, um, and this is quite impressive actually. Uh, and it has a skill in the Brasky scores and also in the reliability <coughs> component. So the, the forecast is, is significantly more reliable. So uh, at the beginning I was scratching my head and I thought why, why we have such a symmetry. But this is actually seems to be fit very well with the recent work that uh, Eileen has done, uh, in which he has shown that there is an asymmetry actually in the connection between an, an AO positive and an AO negative, 
and the teleconnection with the anion negative are much stronger. It seems to fit with this, uh, uh, with these results. Um, and so I think here is the summary. So forecast scale, subseasonal and seasonal range uh, is conditioned by the main modes of tropical variability and so on MGO. So when we assess the model, we need to make sure that the, the variability of these important modes is very well represented. And also we need to make sure that uh, um, forecasts uh, at subseason and seasonal scale are, are quite accurate in reproduced teleconnections. Um, then uh, just say words that the S2S archive is an extremely valuable um, tool to assess predictability. Um, I'll show you a bit the potential of this two-dimensional diagram, which is very simple, very limited, but uh, it has uh, uh, quite, um, uh, it facilitates understanding transitions uh, among some important uh, um, uh, flow patterns. I'll show you that uh, we, are, we, have, um, uh, we have this asymmetry, we have found this asymmetry in the skill scores uh, sensitivity with the MGO, uh, so where we found the most higher sensitivity for the NEO negative and uh, uh, no significant sensitivity for NEO positive. Uh, 